Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Vladimir Putin has chosen war. He has invaded Ukraine after a an interval. The White House has now acknowledged that, in fact, is an invasion, which sets the stage for whatever sanctions we are going to impose on Vladimir Putin, but that did not apparently deter him from uh, what happened yesterday. Also, uh, breaking news as we are beginning to record this podcast, the Supreme Court hands Donald Trump another defeat, he extends his legal losing streak. The Supreme Court denies cert on his challenge of the uh, National Archives turning over documents to the January 6th committee. So we are going to talk about both of those stories with our guest, Tim O'Brien, the executive editor and columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. He is also a political analyst for NBC and MSNBC and the author of Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald, which was a biography originally published in 2005. First of all, good morning, Tim. Hi, Charlie. It's good to talk with you again. It's been a while. Uh, Tim, just for our listeners' benefit, also enjoys the the great advantage of once having been sued by Donald Trump, right? I mean, so you, you, and, you, and, the, you and the Donald and lost. way back. I would like to add that he lost, <laughs> yes, <laughs> before he, we proceed he, too far. He lost, but not before stepping in it several times, which we, I want to get to all of that because you have written some great stuff about the consequences, things that have happened with Trump. He had an extraordinary week last week, losing several cases. Uh, he had his accountants quitting, which is just always a bad thing to happen when you're in business, right? When you I mean, run a business and the people who keep your books sort of vomit and leave, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, and, that's and like... Remember, they're his outside accountants, his inside, in-house accountants been indicted. So he's yeah. <laughs> over two on the accounting front. Well, especially when your whole business model involves borrowing lots of money from people who probably want to look at your financials. I mean, that seems to be problematic. And believe that you're making a good faith effort to assess their value before you borrow money. So let's start, though, by talking about uh, the big story of the day, which, of course, is Russia and Ukraine. I guess one of the big questions out there is, what can we do? Clearly, the threat of sanctions has not been effective in stopping him. But, but you wrote last month that we, the United States, should be prepared to lock Russia out of the international finance system. And, and, and that's one of the big options. So talk to me about that. Is that kind of the, the nuke in, in the arsenal of, of sanctions right now? Yeah, in the financial world, that's a, very good, that's a very good comparison, Charlie. It's essentially the nuclear option in the world of finance. What it would involve is, is as you mentioned, locking Russian banks out of the global banking system. It's known as SWIFT, and it's a pipeline that banks use to transact with one another and to settle payments on all of the nuts and bolts that make economies work globally. Trade, buying and selling, financial markets, et cetera, et cetera. One of the arguments the, the Russians have made is, well, we don't really need access to that anymore. We've started our own global payment system, but thus far, the only there's I think there's one major Chinese bank that has joined that system. It's it doesn't compare to SWIFT. It's not a replacement for SWIFT. The second argument is that any financial sanctions we impose on Russia are going to boomerang back on Western Europe and yeah. the U.S. And I think mm -hmm. they know that and they have to be prepared for that. I think the virtue of it is it helps isolate Russia and penalize Russia in a non-military way. It allows us to have a strong response without going to war. And I think the West has had a lot of half measures towards Putin since he annexed Crimea in 2014. And we imposed sanctions back then, but they were very light relative to what is being considered now. Back then, uh, assets held by Putin's cronies, you know, it's the series of oligarchs in, who have properties in, throughout the world and primarily in Western Europe were seized. They were locked out of the banking system. But it was, it was sort of weak tea. And what's, you know, what's being looked at now in addition to banking is also putting the lid on technology imports and exports that Russia relies on mm -hmm. for both uh, military and commercial technology uses. 
Well, let's talk about the banking thing and and how that actually works and how it might affect Vladimir Putin. Because again, you wrote about this. There's this website called the Wealth Gorilla, which <laughs> came up with an estimate that Putin's fortune is seventy billion dollars. They didn't offer any evidence about that. Uh, Bill Browder, who is a Kremlin critic, um, says Putin's worth about two hundred billion dollars and keeps all of his money in the West. What do you think? I mean, is, I don't think uh, anybody yeah, knows, yeah, Charlie. Yeah. I, I think. The, also, the reality is the Russian state is Vladimir Putin's piggy bank. He can take money out of Gazprom. He can take money out of the banking system anytime he needs it. And so the idea that you're going to hurt him directly by locating and freezing assets, he, he is unlikely to stash directly abroad himself, I think is a, is a real reach. And I think he has proxies among his the people who are close to him financially and politically who do keep assets for him overseas or outside of Russia. But I think it's it's going to be very hard, one, to cut Putin off personally. And secondly, I don't think he cares. There's a long tradition of Russian leaders going back centuries who've been very willing for average Russians to suffer extraordinary pain in their own pursuit of policy goals. And Putin is cut right out of that cloth. And I don't think he cares what the impact will be on average Russians. So let's talk about, though, I want to go back to this, this SWIFT system that you talked about, the international financial system. So how does that work? If Russia is cut off from that system, does that mean that they can't process checks, credit cards? Does it mean that if I want to buy oil from Russia, that I have to have a suitcase stuffed with cash? What, what happens? Which means you, it will be hard to buy Russia from oil from Russia in that scenario, because yeah. obviously you'd need too many suitcases. You know, the easiest way to think about it is when you go online, you know, any of your listeners or you, if you go online to transact financially and you use your bank's website to pay your credit card bill, pay your mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. If you're shut out of that and you can't go into a bank branch, you can't continue to transact. You can't pay your mortgage. You can't pay your heating bill. And that's the macro equivalent of that scenario. Now, Russia has been preparing for this because of the 2014 sanctions. They've, they've built up a humongous amount of currency reserves denominated in mm -hmm. gold and renminbi and rubles. I think it's around $630 billion. It's, I think mm -hmm. it's the fourth largest reserve in the world right now. Um, and, um, and the Russian budget is in balance. Uh, so they've clearly anticipated this. And they're going to have time to be able to wait this out, but it's not something they can they can do forever. Yeah. So what you wrote was, so why not close the door on Russia and autocracy and a kleptocracy with a currency and economy that would seize up if it were denied access to SWIFT? So you think the economy would seize up? Now, obviously, there are people who think that, OK, if you did that, then Russia would just create its own global payment system. They would just go around. You know? Sure, sure. Like because as the Russians go around hacking banking systems and hospitals and educational institutions and government and private institutions around the world, I'm sure lots of other countries would have a lot of faith in any kind of a Russian payment system. Um, I just don't think Russia is probably the last country that that could create an alternative to SWIFT, which isn't a U.S. system, by the way. It's controlled by a consortium of European countries. Um, and there's a committee that runs it that the U.S., by virtue of our own economic heft, is, you know, first among equals, but it's not autonomous within that system. But right, the idea that Russia could come up with an alternative, I think, is such a stretch because Russia just doesn't have a lot of credibility when it comes to observing financial proprieties. So what do you think? What is your take on, on the state of play right now with Russia and Ukraine? They have sent troops in. Vladimir Putin gave this uh, saber rattling speech, making it very clear that he questioned Ukraine's right to exist, etc. You know, wants to restore the Russian empire. And then he sends troops into these independent breakaway separatist areas, which are really part of Ukraine. But he has not actually rolled into this is hard to talk about, isn't it? He hasn't rolled into Ukraine proper, and I understand that's what a long we would call way of Ukraine quite, proper. Yeah, I understand. I understand that that in in some ways that seems to be accepting his narrative to put it that way, and so I, I don't intend to do that. But um, 
it seems that at the moment, Europe and the White House are holding out this sliver of hope that maybe this limited, you know, modified hangout incursion will be all that he does. What is your sense? Is this a precursor to a full on war or will he be content to take this bite? Well, remember that he has sort of de facto exercised control over Donetsk and right. Luhansk, the, the regions you're speaking about in southeast Ukraine for years now in the same way that he's done this in Belarus. You know, the, he, he has used the threat of military force to have puppet governments kneel down to him in those regions. Russia is the only country in the world that recognizes Donetsk and Luhansk as independent entities, and, and Ukrainians themselves don't. So right now he is flexing his muscle, he, muscles. He has sent troops to, um, to the border, obviously. He has started to mass tanks that are heading west towards that border. They started last night. I think the way to think about this, th there's two issues. One is about Russia directly, and the other one is about China. I think when it comes to Russia, does he stop trying to reassemble the former Soviet system and the, and the former Soviet states that broke away from other Russia? And I think in that context, you have to wonder what's, what's he thinking about the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, et cetera. And if he goes to the Baltic states, that's a threat to Scandinavia. I think the Scandinavians have already recognized that. So where does he stop? And I think we are very much in a kind of an appeasement scenario, similar to where Europe was with Hitler on the eve of World War II. There's a lot of differences in that scenario, too. I'm not trying to say it's directly comparable. But when you have someone who's willing to overturn decades of diplomatic and military customs to prevent a land war in Europe, now sort of uh, gesturing towards one, you have to wonder where he's going to stop. The second issue, I think, is China and China's own interest, I think, in ultimately reclaiming Taiwan. I think the Chinese are watching this very closely. They're watching to see how well the Western alliance toes the line and holds the line in this confrontation, because that's going to send a signal about how aggressive China can continue to be in the South China Sea and throughout Asia. So we're also seeing this rather extraordinary domestic political development, which uh, we, we've talked about before. Vladimir Putin's right-wing shills here in the United States, all of these voices that are either in the MAGA world or adjacent to MAGA world, either taking an isolationist line or in, in some cases actually channeling Vladimir Putin's propaganda. What do you make of that? And what do you think Vladimir Putin makes of that? You know, I think this is one of the great issues of our time, actually, Charlie, because you have a major network in Fox. I, I refuse to call it Fox News in Fox, which is essentially a propaganda arm for the far right. And when I say far right, I don't think of them as classically conservative. I don't think of them as people who are interested in solving problems. I think conservatives and liberals have a long history of arguing about the best way to solve problems. But I think the best in both of those groups had a common set of facts they're dealing with. The far right is now counterfactual and propagandic. And they're happy to ally themselves with foreign powers that feed that propaganda machine. You see it in spades, obviously, in Tucker Carlson. He's been inveighing against a strong stance towards Putin and obviously many others at Fox. And I think we're in a really dangerous time because I think I can't recall historically where you had a party and a media apparatus this closely wedded at the hip with a goal, I think, of sowing dissent and division for dissent and division's sake. Hmm. And some of it has a, a very violent component to it, obviously, QAnon, et cetera. And I think we've opened a Pandora's box that was embodied in Trump, but it's now embodied by a big part of the GOP. And I think there's going to be very ugly consequences coming out of all of that. I, I think you can make a case, of course, that what you're seeing now is the result of years and years and years of bipartisan failure to deter him, you know, going back to George W. Bush, looking into Vladimir Putin's eyes and seeing his soul and Hillary Clinton presenting them with yep. the reset button and, you know, President Obama not acting in Syria after they crossed the, the red line. And then, of course, you have the Trump years where you had a president who sided with Vladimir Putin over his own agencies, who was constantly kissing his his ring. 
I, you, you, you probably have seen this, this new meme now, this new narrative on the right um, that, well, you know, Vladimir Putin did not invade when Donald Trump was president because Donald Trump deterred him. In fact, Rich Lowry, the editor of National Review, is tweeting out that, you know, that Vladimir Putin was, af- would have, was afraid to do this. He was afraid of Donald Trump because Donald Trump was so unpredictable and so touchy. And so he didn't dare do this when Trump was in the White House, but now he doesn't fear Joe Biden. So that strikes me as that's it's a hell of a take. Also reminding that, right. that, that Trump's that, ineptitude and yeah. dangerous self-dealing were actually virtues. Yeah, e- exactly. But, you know, give me your sense. Give me your sense of of the, you know, Vladimir Putin, after after four years of having a president who was, you know, willing to truckle to him on a regular basis, what is your, why do you think he didn't do it when Trump was president? And why is he doing it now? What do you think? One, I think Russia plays long ball. Uh, so, so to roll this back that, you know, that I think successive administrations have improperly engaged or recognized who Putin is and what he wants, I, I would agree with that 100%. I also think since I mentioned China earlier, we've seen the same thing evolve in our relationship with China. I think there was a lot of hope um, when she came to power that the United States could forge a good working relationship with China. We have now seen that China is more interested in flexing autocratic muscles than anything else, particularly in Asia. I think the same has been true of Putin. I think in the, you know, in the post-Cold War era, particularly after the Berlin Wall fell, and then you had really robust privatization in in Russia and the sort of blossoming of, of, of democratic political movements in Eastern Europe, that we had entered into a new era and that we should be open-minded about the people on the front lines in these former, what we saw as former autocratic states. And I think that's a healthy place for all of us to be all of the time. I think permanent opposition doesn't get us anywhere in the world. At the same time, if you're dropping your your critical glasses and you're replacing them with sort of rose-colored glasses to wish for a world that actually isn't evolving, you get in a dangerous place. And I think that's what happened with Putin. You know, when 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 Putin succeeded Yeltsin, I, you know, I covered that period mm-hmm. for a time for the New York Times as a reporter. Um, there was this sort of idea that Putin would come in and he would clean up the excesses of privatization but still honor democracy and free markets and liberal reforms, et cetera, et cetera. And he came in and, he, and he's a former KGB guy who just replaced the old oligarchy with new oligarchs beholden to him. And he has had this long-term desire to reassemble the Soviet Union. And, and I think that that's been his long-term goal since the turn of the century. And that's not going to change. That's who he is. And I think he viewed Donald Trump as a useful idiot. You know, I think that the Helsinki conference in which Trump stood up with Putin and denied his own intelligence services take on on Russia's goals and Putin personally was obscene. And I think Putin was happy to simply wait things out and see how they developed during Trump's presidency and beyond. And the idea that Putin didn't invade because he was afraid of Trump is ridiculous. Putin was getting everything he wanted Mm -hmm. from Trump. He's now pushing the envelope further. But as you noted, he's played every single president he's encountered since he became Russia's president. So let's turn that question around. So we were talking about what, what Putin thought of Donald Trump. You've watched Donald Trump for years and years and years as closely as anyone. What does, how do you explain Donald Trump's fascination with Vladimir Putin? What does he think of Vladimir Putin? What, when he looks at Putin, what does he see? You know, the late New York gossip columnist Liz Smith, who watched Trump for years, and she was a gossip columnist for the Daily News and very shrewd observer of the Manhattan scene, once said to me, Liz was from Texas, and she said, you know, honey, the only thing you need to know about Donald Trump is he's a seven-year-old grown old. And <laughs> Donald Trump has a fascination with parades and big military power and tough guys in an almost a cartoonish way. He felt the same way about John Gotti that I think he feels about Vladimir Putin. He likes 
tough guys who get to do what they want. And he projects his own desire in himself to do that onto them. So wait, 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 wait. This is not really it. So, so Trump admired John Gotti? The, I should know Oh, that. yes. Yes. In fact, in my book, at one point, he said, say anything you want about John Gotti. But when he was on trial, he just sat there and he looked at the world with a big, and he had an expletive for that, yeah, with a big yeah. look on his face. Huh. And he never cried. Trump always sees men weeping as an incredible sign of weakness. And he said, God, he never cried. And I think he looks at Putin and thinks, Putin never cried. I think there's a stunted emotional and psychological attraction he has for people like that. I think the second thing is financial. If you put a bag of money on Donald Trump's desk, he will love you. And I think he had been interested for a long time about doing deals in Russia. I think when Trump entered the Oval Office, I think front of his mind was, how can I monetize the authority in the office I now hold? And I think he saw Putin as a conduit for, for padding his own wallet. And I think that's another reason he coddled Putin the way that he did. Well, that's a great segue to talk about uh, Donald Trump's uh, wallet. He's, let's, let's talk about his legal losing streak. And, and again, you know, we've been we've been through this over and over and over again. The um, you know the mantra, well, you know, this is it for for Donald Trump. Well, that you know, this is the walls are closing in on Donald Trump, and yet somehow he manages to evade all of this. Give me your sense of how significant the threats are. There are multiple threats. There are different you know uh, investigations in into him. Is there any reason to believe that any of these will turn out differently than the? long string of failures in the past to hold them accountable? I'll give you a bad answer to that. Yes and no. Okay. Um, you know, on the on the yes side of the ledger, I think we have to recognize that the circumstances he finds himself in now are fundamentally and radically different mm. from any of the legal and business and personal clashes he, he encountered in the past. In New York State, he has a New York State Attorney General and a, a Manhattan District Attorney who both are very well-resourced law enforcement officials uh, with aggressive and sophisticated staffs who are intent on deciding whether or not Donald Trump has committed a crime. The New York AG is civil. The Manhattan DA is criminal. I think the Manhattan DA, is, because it's a criminal case, presents a more existential threat to Trump because he could wind up in jail if that plays out. And all of his legal and business wrangling in the past just didn't involve opponents like that or those kind of stakes. When he and I litigated, he sued me for libel for a book I wrote about him. Mm -hmm. I had the New York Times as attorneys in my corner, as well as my book publisher hired a great team of attorneys uh, headed by Mary Jo White, the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District. And they destroyed Trump's attorneys in that litigation. You know, we just ended up stripping the bark off of him like an old tree. And we deposed him for two days. It remains an embarrassing deposition and a revealing deposition. Yeah. But I was a journalist. You now have law enforcement people doing the same thing, asking the same questions my book asked, uh, questioning his accountants. So on the, you know, on the investigative side of the ledger, that's a real threat. On the business side, it's an incredible threat. You could see his entire the Trump organization unravel over this. It's a, it's, a, it's a business that, as you mentioned earlier, is highly dependent on loans to give it the fuel it needs to keep doing real estate transactions. He's a small player in the real estate world, but like all real estate developers, he needs bank loans to keep functioning. And it's going to be hard for any bank to do business or investor or business partner to continue to work with him when there are investigations hanging over his head. And his inside and outside accountants believe that what he's doing smells too much to kind of stay inside the fold. You asked an interesting question about the, the accounting for Mazars. Yes. What took you so long, Mazars? What, what did you mean? Well, because there's nothing new here. Mazars has said they now feel that they can't attest to um, financial statements. They helped, can't support financial statements. They helped Trump draft over the last decade or so. And we deposed Mazar's accountants in, in, in my litigation. And it was on this very issue, was Trump inflating the value of his assets when it suited him and deflating them when it suited him? I wasn't asking that in a, you know, in a criminal context. I, he, was, he was disputing 
the accounts in my book said that he had been doing that for decades, which he had, of course, and which he continues to do today, in, including in that wacky Yosemite Stam statement he put out last week, <laughs> claiming that he's worth $8 billion, which he's not. I think that Mazers, like Trump, never had a law enforcement on the other side of the table. Um, and it never had to worry about whether or not it would get swept into the legal nightmare that's now surrounding Trump. And I think they had a, you know, they had a statement in their letter when they resigned their position with him saying that they had a non waivable conflict, which I, I translate into English as we're cooperating with law enforcement. Mm. And I think that they are probably working with the New York attorney general at this point and trying to save their own hide. But the behavior that they're suddenly finding distasteful is completely not new at all. Now, people in New York real estate, or at least some people will argue, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this over and over again, is that inflating or deflating the value of your property um, is, is a common practice, that, uh, that they play these games all the time. Is there anything distinctive about what Donald Trump, I mean, Donald Trump's going to be going, you know, okay, I'm not doing anything that everybody else doesn't do, right? That will be one of his defenses. W what is the answer to that? The, the answer is that members of the real estate community in New York City know that Trump does all of this in a completely out of bounds way that I, I don't think, I can't think of anyone else that does this, particularly when you look at some of the major real estate families and entities in New York, they don't roll like this at all. They're engaged in the life of the city. They run their businesses in a much more observant way than Donald Trump ever has. So no, he's not part of the norm. I think there are always squishy parameters around how you value a piece of property. Again, you know, to bring it back to our own world, all of us, when we get a mortgage on a house, have to hire someone to assess its value. Right. So the bank is making sure that it's not loaning too much money to us because they need to claim that house as an asset if we can't pay our mortgage back. And so when we hire an assessor, there's always some wiggle room in how it's a subjective decision when the assessor decides how much our house is worth. Trump is essentially saying that's the world I'm in, in, in real estate in New York and elsewhere. And it's just a little variation here and there, but it's nothing extreme. But of course, we know now from the filings that Tish James has made that, you know, he was doubling and tripling valuations, including on his own apartment in Trump Tower in absurd ways. Now, the issue as to whether or not that's criminal will reside with whether or not he misled tax authorities who certainly lack some of the sophistication that the private sector does when looking at something like this, and whether he misled investors and banks. And they're going to have to prove that Trump knew it was wrong and he did it anyway. And that's a very high bar to overcome. So just on a practical level, I know we've, you've addressed this, but if Trump can't find another accountant, right, while this is going on, how does he continue to do business? How does he continue to borrow money? I mean, he how do you how, to borrow money if he doesn't have an accountant? Oh, okay. And, and is there any accountant that wants to like jump into this now? I'm just trying to, you well, know. here's the thing. I, you know, I, and I should backtrack on that a little. Right. I should say domestically, he's going to have a very hard problem. Ah, okay. uh, does Saudi Arabia and, and its own investment fund care about whether Donald Trump has an accountant or does Russia or any other outside power if they see him as someone they can coddle and then get favors from later, particularly if he gets elected again in 2024? I think not. And um, Steve Mnuchin and Jared Kushner have already been fundraising in the Middle East for their own investment funds um, the, with the UAE and with the Saudis. Uh, the Saudis are now uh, stepping up to finance Trump's um, championship golf venture as an alternative to the PGA. Um, one, that's a national security threat that people should recognize as such, that, you know, that a former president is being essentially bribed uh, as, we, uh, as we watch. Uh, the SPAC he's using to launch a social media company uh, has commitments of a billion dollars, and they haven't disclosed yet who those entities are making those commitments. So you have this prospect of a former president who's going to start a social media company that potentially oversees funding, a president who has hundreds of millions of short-term debt coming due in the next four years that he may not be able to repay, who's also coddling foreign powers, 
any former president who's under investigation and has accountants who won't work for him who desperately needs money. It's a, it's a very ugly scenario from the financial, political, and national security standpoints. But will it make a difference? And you, you know what I'm asking. You know, all of the, the things over the last five or six years, there's no mysteries about Donald Trump. We know who he is. We know what he's done. After January 6th, I think, you know, for about five minutes, it looked like Republicans were going to bail on him. He's as popular with Republicans as ever. Does any of this actually hurt him politically? And I've been asked before, and I said, if, if Donald Trump is charged but not convicted, it doesn't hurt him. It makes him even stronger. Is that too cynical? No, I don't think that's you cynical. Can, I would agree. I would agree with that, Charlie. You can say yes. Yeah. You can say yeah. Charlie, you're a cynic. You're just no, no. I agree with you, but I'm a cynic too. I guess okay, we're both I cynics. I guess okay. that's why we're friends. But uh, <laughs> you know, I think it doesn't matter to his core political base that 30 percent or so of the Republican Party that like famously doesn't care if he shoots someone on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. I think it matters to independent voters. And I think that independent voters hold all the power right now. As you know, they're the the sort of swing vote that determines whether or not you get Democrats or Republicans in the White House. And I think this stuff does matter to them. And I think you've seen some fraying around that recently with Trump and, and the things swirling around I, Trump. I Will that you know, get traction long-term? I don't know. Very, very specifically, and I should have asked this before, in these cases, Donald Trump will have to decide at some point whether or not he's going to plead the Fifth Amendment or whether he's going to take the chance that he lies under oath. Now, you've had experience with his depositions. What do you think he will do? (laughs) He's such a nightmare client (laughs) for any lawyer because he doesn't stick to the script they prepare for him, and he's a pathologic liar. Yes. So it's, you know, dropping him into, um, you know, it's it's tragic comic. If he wasn't a former president, this would just be comic. But because he could have power again, it's tragic comic and, and, and yeah. unnerving. Yeah. Um, I think he will both plead the fifth rampantly. Eric did it hundreds of times in his own deposition, his son, Eric. I also think he can't, he won't be able to help himself at times because he's deeply insecure and needy, and he will exaggerate and or lie during parts of that deposition, even when he should keep his mouth shut. I think you're right about that. And I also think that that's something that can certainly be weaponized because he's talked about people uh, taking the Fifth Amendment. There's, it's on tape. It's in his permanent record. So I also want to ask you about, so speaking of his legal losing streak, there was also the ruling last week by the federal judge that ruled that the January 6th civil case against Trump will go ahead. And this is this is this long ruling by Judge Meta. Meta. I guess it was like, um, yeah, Meta, the 112 page opinion rejecting Trump's assertion that he had absolute immunity and then really connecting him rather significantly to what happened on January 6th. So that's a civil lawsuit. Give me your take on that. Because I guess what's interesting is that that stands in contrast to the complete lack of any action from the Department of Justice on all of this. But it's the one thing that seems possible to hold him legally accountable for his role in the coup. Yeah, I think it was a, a really important ruling. And it, and it sits aside now various district court rulings, appellate court rulings, and Supreme Court opinions that the common thread among all of them is that He doesn't enjoy executive privilege. He doesn't reside above the law as a former president. And I think that's important regardless of the party of the president. I think that's a building block of the rule of law. And the other thing about that ruling specifically that I think was really important was Judge Mehta said, I'm dropping, you know, Mo Brooks. I'm dropping uh, Don Jr. I'm dropping Rudy Giuliani from this case, but I'm keeping Donald Trump. And I'm keeping Donald Trump because he incited the insurrection and the violence that led to the Capitol building getting stormed and wasn't mealy mouthed in that view and held Trump personally accountable as the individual for who set all of that in motion, That's which pretty means extraordinary. that Trump has no. a liability legally. And historically, it's yet another statement that I think correctly identifies the role he played in all of that. 
you know, this is rather extraordinary. And I know that there's always the danger that we get numbed after five or six years of dealing with this. But a federal judge basically arguing it's plausible that Trump conspired with two of these militias, you know, to engage in these the overthrow of the government. This is, you know, on Earth 2.0, this would be like a really, really big deal, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, sure would. to have, a, to you have know, a ruling like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, the, the real world impact of the Donald Trump era is that there are so many outrages and, and corruptions yeah. on a daily basis that you start to lose an ability to prioritize which ones are the worst. Yes, exactly. And, you know, you, you made a point that I wanted to underline that, you know, there's the fundamental principle at stake right now, which is, is the president above the law? Because, I mean, Donald Trump has argued and behaved as if the laws do not apply to him, that he is above the law. And as of now, he has faced no consequences whatsoever. Give me your sense of the way that the Department of Justice is going about investigating these things and whether anything will come out of the January 6th committee. I guess the question is, what are the prospects that Donald Trump or members of his administration will be held accountable for their behavior in the way that members of the Nixon administration were held legally accountable for Watergate. Well, in much the same way that I wish the West would take a stronger line with Putin and had done it earlier, I wish law enforcement agencies in the United States would take a stronger line with Donald Trump and had done so earlier. Yeah. I was disappointed that the Mueller investigation essentially punted on a, on a financial examination of what might have motivated Trump, the Trump mm-hmm. camp's intersections with Russia. Mm-hmm. I think Merrick Garland... It's been very tentative. I feel like there's enough evidence in the public realm now. Trump has admitted to to inciting the insurrection. And I wish Garland was more aggressive. Having said that, I think he understands that he is possibly considering indicting a former president or people close to him and that the stakes in that are very, very high. And he wants to make sure that he's got all of the legal gaps buttoned up around that. Um, but, you know, the, the January 6th committee and the Department of Justice, I think, are on, I would hope, parallel tracks. If they're not, we're in trouble. I actually, I'm, I'm more optimistic and less cynical about the January 6th committee than I am usually about Congress. I just usually uh-huh. assume that these committees and these uh, hearings are going to be shit shows. Um, I have been tentatively, preliminarily... <laughs> impressed by this, this, the speed and the scope of the January 6th investigation. It is remarkable how many witnesses they have been, they have, uh, they've talked to, uh, how many documents they have gathered, how many new facts they have put together. So I, I'm, I don't know. And then they're also moral exemplars, right? I think in an era in which Trump has cowed institutions and other people, you know, I think, I think it's an authentically bipartisan committee. And I think, particularly for the Republicans on it who've come under, you know, obviously Liz Cheney, the pressure she's come under and Kinziger, um, they've put their careers on the line to do the right thing. Well, and I think that the fact that they're working so hard to excommunicate them is really in many ways an indication of how big a threat they happen to see. So one last thought, I think the, the Supreme Court decision today is not the most important decision that's come down. But I'm guessing that that sitting down in Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump has been thinking that, OK, I can lose this case, I can lose this case, but I have the ultimate Trump card. I have my Supreme Court and they will back me up. And yet he continues to lose in the Supreme Court. That's got to bother him a lot to realize that the courts are not going to play along the way he thought they would. I have to imagine he's driving some putters into the desktop in Mar-a-Lago over that because his understanding of the way government and the legal system work is you do someone a favor, they owe you a favor back. And he appointed those justices and they should take care of him. And now they're not. I'm sure that irks him to no end. Tim O'Brien is the executive editor and columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, Tim. Always a treat, Charlie. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.